Thanks for joining me today. We are going to focus on creating a project schedule in Smartsheet. I absolutely love Smartsheet because it's very collaborative. I've always been a big advocate for MS Project. However, using Smartsheet works best when you're working really closely with teams and would like for them to make updates directly to the project schedule. You can use Smartsheet both internal to your organization or external to your organization if you're working with clients or other organizations on a major project. I'm Candace Porter. I have a master's degree in project management from George Washington University, and I am also PMP certified. I look forward to getting started, and I'm going to begin with an overview of the steps that you should be taking to create your project schedule prior to entering it into a tool such as Smartsheet. First and foremost, when you are developing a project schedule, you want to create a work breakdown structure. I have a different video on going through the specific steps for this. However, I wanna provide a quick overview of what a work breakdown structure looks like. Here is an example work breakdown structure from Project Management Institute. This very top level, this is called level one, and this is where your project name goes. You'll see here that this is building a bicycle. This next level of work is called the level two work breakdown structure. And what you want to do is have level two as the main component, so the main deliverables that are going to be required in order to successfully meet the objectives of your project. Below the level two, this would be level three, and you can tell by the numbering system as well. So we have one for the bicycle, 1.1 for the frame set, 1.1.1 for the actual frame. You will see that under integration, we also go down to level four, 1.6.4.1. The lowest level of your work breakdown structure it is called the work package level. And this is where you'll wanna focus on estimating time, cost, and resources. You will also hear me reference when we're working in Smartsheet, the work breakdown structure dictionary. This is an important piece of the scope baseline as it provides additional details on what each of the elements are. For example, for the frame set, it gives the description, the individual components that together constitute the frame once assembled. This can be a really valuable thing to have so that there is no gray area in regards to what the deliverables are. You can also insert a column for cost if your organization will be assigning some type of a control number so that you can link it back directly to the work breakdown structure. Also at a high level, you can put in there the department or the organization that will be responsible for delivering this particular work. You can tell by looking at this what level it is within your work breakdown structure. So again, level one, project level. We've got level two, frame set, and then we break down into the level three for each of the components. This is what a WBS dictionary looks like and it can easily be created in Excel. We're going to be working with building a new house today. You'll see here we've got level one, new house, and level two, management, structural, electrical, and finishing. Everything below, you can go ahead and assume that that's going to be our level three for the purpose of building our schedule in Smartsheet. Four best practices when you're creating a work breakdown structure includes the 100% rule. You wanna make sure that all work is accounted for without gaps. This should include the project management aspects as well. The 880 rule means that a particular task can be completed in no less than eight hours and no more than 80 hours of effort. This is to give you that ballpark range if you're trying to break the work down into half hour increments over a two year project, you have probably gone too far. 
So aim for the task that range between eight and 80 hours when you're breaking the work down. The single point of responsibility rule, this means that the deliverable or task can be accomplished by a single point of responsibility. So when you're assigning a resource, it can be assigned to one person to accomplish. Last but not least, the adequate for estimating rule. This means that the deliverable is described in enough detail to enable reliable estimates of time and cost. That is something that you can also further describe in your work breakdown structure dictionary. Once you have your work breakdown structure created, then you wanna sequence the activities and define dependencies. Before I show you what this looks like, I want to go through a little bit of terminology with you. A predecessor is an activity that precedes another activity. So you really want to understand the relationship. This task must be accomplished before this task can begin. That's called a predecessor, the one that comes first. A successor is one that comes second. That's what follows as far as the work for the task. An activity can have several predecessors. It can also have several successors. A project milestone is a task of zero duration that shows an important achievement in a project. I always like to put project milestones in for my project start date and my project end date and any major decisions that need to be made along the way. We'll talk about this when we're building out our smart sheet. This is what it looks like when you are sequencing and defining dependencies. You can build this out in something like Visio. The level two work breakdown structure, the main buckets of work are down this left-hand side, finishing, management, structural, electrical, and it shows what order the work needs to be accomplished in. Here's that project start milestone I referenced. The first thing that we're going to do is hire an architect. Once that is complete, we can approve designs. So that's going to be another milestone. We can then move forward with hiring the engineer. I won't go through each of the different tasks, but this is what it would look like if you are sequencing and defining dependencies. Next, what you'll want to do is resource and estimate the activities. When we're talking about estimating the activities, we're talking about cost and duration. How long is it going to take to complete this work? And the last, what we're going to be focusing primarily on today is entering the project schedule into a tool, which will be Smartsheet, and setting the schedule baseline. A schedule baseline is something that is, a schedule baseline is the original approved scope of work that needs to be accomplished. This is what you're going to measure progress against once you move into the execution phase. When you hear people say, are we ahead of schedule? Are we behind schedule? They are talking about your current state in comparison to that baseline. I also want to touch on the critical path as this is something that's important to understand in project management. A critical path is the sequence of activities that represents the longest path through a project which determines the shortest possible duration. To boil that down, it is the task that really end up making the start date and the finish date of your project schedule. For example, the critical path for this visual would be task one, task three, and task five. You know that because there is margin associated with task two and task four. Therefore, if we wanted to find a way to shorten our overall project schedule by adding additional resources to specific tasks, if we added additional resources to tasks two and four, it would not actually shorten the end date of our project. We would need to add them to task three in order to shorten the duration of task three. We could also add resources to task one or task five because that would also shorten the duration of our overall project. Critical paths are dynamic and can change. So if we were to add additional resources to task three, and we made that task shorter than task two and task four added together, 
we're going to have a new critical path, which would be task one, task two, task four, and task five. I'm going to show you how you can look at your critical path within Smartsheet, which is why I wanted to give a little recap on what it actually is. First thing, go ahead and log into Smartsheet, www.smartsheet.com. I definitely encourage you to follow along. So if you do not have a Smartsheet account, you can sign up for a free 30-day trial. I have included the link in the description of this video, and I recommend that you pause the video right now and set up your account if you don't have one. If you do, simply log in. This is what Smartsheet looks like once you get logged in. I have also set up a free trial for this video to make sure that everything I'm sharing with you is available on the version that you'll be using. If your Smartsheet doesn't look like this once you log in, if the left panel isn't showing over here, you can always click on these three lines. These three lines are always going to take you to the left panel menu, which is where you're going to find a lot of the things that I'm going to showcase now. The first thing that I wanna do, I want to set up a new workspace. The workspace, it does give you a single folder location where you can store things that are all related, but it's more than that. It's a full-fledged environment in which you can not only organize your sheets and reports, but you can also set special permissions at the workspace level. This will be important if you're going to be sharing your sheets with other people. Go ahead and hover over workspaces and right-click on it. You'll see an option to create new workspace. I'm going to go ahead and name mine Building a New House. Click OK, and you will see it show up right here. The next thing that I want to do is double click on it so that I'm working within the workspace. You'll see that it defaults to the owner, which should be you, and I don't currently have it shared with anyone. What I want to do next is go up here to where there is a Create drop down menu. If you click on that little arrow that's pointing down, It'll give you a lot of different options for getting your project schedule started. If you have a schedule that is already built out in Excel, Microsoft Project, if you've got something in Google Sheets, you can go ahead and import it from all of these. What I'm going to do is start it from scratch. So I'm going to click on the project option here. Once I click on that, I'm going to name my sheet I'm also going to name this Building a New House Project Plan. Click OK. And there you go. You now see that you have your project within your workspace of building a new house. I'm going to click on it now. And this is what it looks like once you get in the project. The project defaults to Gantt View the first thing that I recommend you do when you're building your project from scratch is change the view of it to grid view. So if you go up here where it says Gantt view, click on the little arrow and change that to grid view. It's going to give you a lot more space to get it set up so that you can enter all of the information. I'm going to give you a high level overview now of what the default settings are when you open a new project. You'll see here on the far left hand side, there's a little paper clip and this is for attachments. So you can go ahead and attach any documents that you have relating to the actual project. And you can do this at the row level. If there is something specific to the row level, you can make sure that you attach the specific document there. Right next to that is a column for comments. You can add comments for each of the rows as well. To the right of that, there's a little I. This is your indicators column. This gives you row level reminders for things such as locked rows, pending update requests, and over allocated resources. We've got the task name here. This is going to be where we enter our scope or our work. We have duration here, and you will notice that duration defaults to days. 
the number of days that it will take to accomplish the task. Remember when we talked about the work breakdown structure, we provided a range of no less than eight hours to accomplish the task and no more than 80 hours to accomplish the task. That's the ideal range for your work package level. We've got the start column here. This is going to be dates. So this is your start date that the work will begin for your task. And this is the finish date. So this is when you will end the work on this specific task. Here is the predecessor column. We talked about predecessors earlier. This is something that must be accomplished first before the next task can be completed if they're linked. So this is your predecessor column. What you will do to enter a predecessor is enter the number associated with the row. So for example, if one was going to be a predecessor to two, I would go ahead and enter one in this column. Assigned to, these are the people that are going to be accomplishing the task or the work. This is the percent complete. The next column status, you can see that it defaults to a drop down here. Three options, not started, in progress, and complete. You will see here there is another comments field and this will be anything that you want to be able to view when you're in grid view. So if I add a comment over here, for example, project start date is September 1. You go ahead and type that in and click enter and that will show up. You will now see that I have a little comment field there and I would need to click on that to see the comment. However, if I put a comment in this field, you will see that it continues to show up. So just whichever you prefer as far as entering the comments there. Again, if I put it in the far left hand one, I'll have to click on it to get the conversations to pop up in the far right hand side and then the comments column, it will remain there. If you are familiar with Excel, you'll see that the toolbar up here at the top pretty similar as far as a lot of the functionality here. The view, this is an important one and I already showed you how to change from Gantt view to grid view. We'll take a look at these views a little bit later, but just know that that exists. You also have a filter option as you do in Excel and you can name your filters so that they remain. You then have your text, the type, the size, your bold, italics, underline, strike through. You can color code either the rows or the text. You can insert images. This is a shortcut for inserting rows or inserting columns. And then you have a lot of the different formatting for the different individual cells or columns. It's just good to get familiar with these again pretty similar to what Excel offers if you're familiar with that. Now that I've shown you the toolbar, I wanna to show you one more thing that you should do before you get started. You can click or hover over any of the columns and you'll see that this drop down arrow shows up. I'd like for you to click on that drop down arrow and it's going to give you an option to edit project settings. Go ahead and click on that before you get started with entering anything in. Once you open this, you will see that there's dependency settings. Smartsheet project, when you add a new one, it defaults to dependencies enabled. Just double check that yours are enabled when you start setting up your project. Another thing that I always like to look at are working days. Now this is where you put in days of the week that are actually considered working days for your organization and the length of the day. So this will be important because say for example that you work four days a week and they're 10 hour days. You want it to show the realistic dates once you get all of your logic entered. And so what you would wanna do if you don't work Fridays is uncheck Friday and put that Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday 
are 10 hours in duration. So you can update that. And then if there are any non-working days that are holidays or exceptions that fall on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday, you can enter the actual dates in here separated by a comma and it will make sure that it takes those out of the equation when it's calculating your logic. Since this project will be on five days a week, eight hour days, I'm gonna go ahead and put that back in here and then click OK. I have a couple of personal preferences as far as the columns that I like to have when I'm setting up my projects. So I'm gonna insert a couple of columns. In addition to being able to click the insert column shortcut here, you can also right click on any of the columns and it will give you the option to insert the column to the left or insert the column to the right. I'm going to go ahead and insert a column to the left. There are a lot of different options for how you would like the column to be set up. You can set it up as text or number, so you can just type it in manually. A contact list, date, a drop-down list where you can only select one, a drop-down list where you can select more than one, checkbox, symbols, and then an auto numbering system. For the sake of the column I wanna set up, I want it to be a text and number because I want this to be my work breakdown structure numbering system. So I want this to align to my work breakdown structure dictionary. That way each of these rows and the work associated with them all align. What I'm going to do now is actually enter the work breakdown structure that was completed already into this tool. My level one building a house will be a parent relationship to all of my level two, which are considered child relationships. Therefore, I wanna enter my management task 1.1, management. And in order to ensure that that is showing up and now to make sure that this is a parent-child relationship, I want to select the management task and indent in. That's going to make sure that they are linked as a parent-child relationship. The start date for a parent will automatically set to the earliest start date from all of its child rows. The end date will also be set to the last end date from all of its child rows. You will also see that the duration on the parent reflects the number of working days between the start date and the end date in that row. It provides the full time span encompassed by that section of task from the earliest subtask to the latest, as opposed to the sum of their durations. So it does not sum the durations. It looks at the earliest subtask to the latest and rolls that up. The percentage complete row in regards to parent and child, it will calculate a weighted percentage based on both the duration and the percent complete entered on each child row. So that will be summarized on the parent row. Okay, so let's go ahead and start entering more of this information. How I'm going to go about this is enter all of my tasks first and make sure that I get the parent child relationships correct. Under management, I have hire architect, approved designs, hire engineers, file permits, hire contractor, hire landscaper, And then I want to have a couple of milestones in there as far as project start and project complete. All of these tasks should be child tasks in regards to management. So I'm going to indent those and you'll now see we have level one, level two, and level three. I'm going to go ahead and get these entered for all of the different tasks now. Okay, you will see that I now have all of my tasks in here. I have put my level one and level two work breakdown structure numbers in this column. And in order to check to make sure that you have all of the parent-child relationships correct, you can click on this little minus sign next to each of the level two and make sure that everything rolls up 
under it that should be a child task. So there's my management 1.1, everything under management rolled up. And do the same for my 1.2, for my 1.3, and my 1.4. You will see here, this is level one, and this is all of my level two. Now, if I click on the minus sign here, okay, everything rolls up now. There's my level one, there's my level two, there's my level three. And if I wanted to break the work down any further, I could go ahead and add level four, level five, and so forth. What we're gonna do now is enter the rest of our information. Project start is simply a milestone. What I have included this in here for is because I want to put the actual date that our project begins and make sure that the rest of the logic is linked into that. Now, you only want to enter the information such as durations, predecessors, assigned to, percent complete, status, cost. You want to enter that at your lowest level of your work breakdown structure. So I'm only going to focus on entering that in my level three. As I mentioned earlier, this information will start to automatically roll up to the parent task and I'll show you what that looks like. Project start, I'm gonna put in zero duration because it's a milestone. We are going to say that our start date begins September 1st. That's going to be our project start date. There's not going to be a predecessor. This project start is not going to be assigned to anyone. And once September 1st hits, that's when you can mark it as 100% complete and mark it as completed. There's no cost since it's just a milestone and we don't need to add any comments. Now, once the project starts, that's when we can actually begin doing the work of hiring an architect. If you recall when we were sequencing the activities and defining those dependencies, that's what we're gonna look at now and make sure that they're all entered in here correctly. So we estimated that it will take five days in order to hire the architect. Now we don't need to enter any dates in here because once we get our logic entered, it's going to auto populate those for us. So you can go ahead and enter five days in duration and then skip over to predecessors. And what we wanna put in here for the predecessor is the project start date. If you look at the row that project start falls on, it's going to be row three. We simply need to enter a three in here. What that does, once this project start begins, it's going to go ahead and prompt to hire the architect as the first task. We're not going to put anything else in at this point. We're just going to go through and enter all of our durations and all of our predecessors and you will start to see that the dates auto-populate. For approving designs, that is simply a milestone. We just wanna know that when those are approved that we can go ahead and move forward. So zero days duration. However, there are predecessors. We want to enter hiring an architect as a predecessor. There we go, it populates the date for us. Next, we wanna hire the engineer. We have five days for that. And the predecessor for hiring an engineer is that the designs are approved. I'm gonna continue on entering all of this in here and then I will showcase a few more items for you. You will now see that I've gone through and entered all of my duration in days and then all of my predecessors for each of the tasks. If I now roll up finishing, you will see that all of the work for finishing will begin September 8th and it will end by November 27th. For electrical, all of the work will begin 922 and end November 11th. Structural will begin September 22nd and November 24th. And my management task here will begin the day the project begins on September 1 
and will end November 27th. Now, the entire project of building a house, it's 64 days in duration. It starts September 1st and it finishes November 27th. I'm going to expand all of these again here. And I wanna show you why it's so important to have logic in your schedule. Yes, it is going to help you manage those timelines much easier. If, for example, hiring an architect actually took 14 days instead of five, rather than trying to manually go in and sort out when the tasks that follows are going to be starting and ending, you can simply go in and enter that hiring an architect 14 days in duration and all of the dates will automatically change for you. You'll see that the overall project finish date is now December 12th. This is really great, especially for scenario planning, for some of those what if scenarios. It's a great way for calculating for risk. It could actually take me 24 days to hire the engineer. What's that look like if I enter 24 for hiring the engineer? Is now going to finish on the 6th of January. Okay, so what are we gonna enter next? We now have all of the tasks entered. We went ahead and numbered our work breakdown structure again, just to level two. What I recommend you do here is make sure that anything that you enter here aligns with your work breakdown structure dictionary. I mentioned that earlier. If you number all of your work breakdown structures to the lowest level, I recommend going ahead and entering it in your project schedule the same way. We've got all the durations entered. Now we know that our overall project's gonna be 92 days, starting September 1st, finishing by January 6th. Here's all of our logic built in. We thought through all of our predecessors here, and this aligns with the steps that we took to sequence and define those dependencies. We can now go ahead and enter who the work is going to be assigned to. Now, this is going to be people that we put in this column. Again, you don't want to enter anyone as far as being assigned to the parent task. So you want to make sure that you are entering this at the lowest level of the child task. For the hire the architect, I wanna enter someone to do this. It's going to be Mary. Mary works in our human resources department and it's going to be her responsibility for hiring the architect. If I start to type in Mary's name, you can see that I already have her set up as a resource. So I'm going to go ahead and select Mary's name. And if it's the first time that you are doing this, once you've set up your project, it's going to let you know that because you've assigned a new row in this sheet, you can now notify team members when a row gets assigned to them. So basically, this is the automation as far as the workflow goes. And once you get everyone set up and assigned to their task, you can notify them via email what they're going to be working on. I'm gonna click not right now. I'll show you that in a little bit. Approve designs, that's gonna be Mark. Mark's gonna be the project sponsor. And if I start to type in Mark, I'll see that he's not in there. So I need to click add new. I'll enter Mark's name. And there's a good chance you're going to wanna to use first and last names for the sake of simplicity, I'm not. And enter an email address. I've now got Mark in there. I'm gonna click okay. So now you'll see we've got Mary assigned to one, Mark assigned to one. I would want to go ahead and enter who's going to be assigned to each of the tasks, again, at the lowest level, the lowest child level. Let's go ahead and assume that I have everyone entered now. And I do want to make sure that they are notified every time that they are assigned to a task. So let's focus on setting up some automation. I'm going to go ahead and click on automation up here. And this is one of the things that I really love about Smartsheet is that it is heavy on collaboration. That's one of the main focuses here. You'll see there are a lot of different options here. And once you get familiar with creating and managing workflows, you can accomplish some really complex things in here. I'd encourage you to explore this if that's something that you're interested in doing. I wanna focus on alerting someone. This is a popular workflow, so they've already got it 
pretty much programmed in. I've clicked on notify someone and you can name your workflows, notify project team members of task. That's what I want to name this one. And it gives you a lot of different options for how to set it up. Trigger, when rows are added or changed. That's what I'm going to select here. When any field changes. So when any field on any row changes, I want someone to be notified. That way, if we notice that the durations are increasing or decreasing, if the dates are changing based on something changing with the project, I want people that are assigned to that actual task to be notified. So when any field changes, and I wanna run it when it's triggered. So this will only send notifications if rows are added or changed. So this is all set up correctly the way that I want it right now. Now, I wanna alert someone. You could send it to specific people. So let's pretend that I am the project manager. I can set it up to where I get notified anytime anything changes. I don't recommend that you do that if you have a lot of tasks on the project because you're gonna end up getting endless emails. Instead of myself being notified, I'm gonna clear myself out. I wanna send it to specific people, but contacts in a cell. Okay, let's focus on contacts in a cell and then select a contact field. You'll see that only people are entered in the assigned to row, so that's what I wanna select. So let's look at this now. When rows are added or changed in any field, that's when this is triggered and I want it to alert someone. I want it to send it to contacts in a cell with that specific cell falling in the assigned to column. Now I see this little notification down here. Some recipients may not get notified. Change your permission settings. If you see that pop up for you, you need to click on it and you will see that you can change the automation permissions here. Unrestricted, that's where we're gonna focus for right now. Users shared to this sheet, users in the same account as the sheet owner, any email referenced in this workflow. If you saw when I was setting up Mark's account, I entered his name and an email. So that means that his email is now referenced in the workflow. We won't cover that today, but just know that this does integrate with Microsoft Teams and Slack. I'm now gonna set unrestricted up, okay. And then I'm going to save, there we go. You will see that it is set up where people now will be alerted and that's called notify project team members of task. I only want to change the dates by increasing or decreasing the durations. I'm gonna move this, oh, we finished early. It's now 12 days. Mary will now get a notification because something in her row changed and Mark will also get a notification because that is a predecessor to his task. So they will both get notifications. Percent complete here. You only wanna update at the lowest levels and so 0% is where everything's at. And if you saw when I entered it for project start, it automatically started to roll up. We know that everything is at 0% here, so we can just drag it down. The status, nothing started yet because our project doesn't start until September 1st. So when I was giving an example of us finishing this early, it's not actually started, but if the project was started, and you finished it early, you decrease the duration so that the finish date aligns with today's date and everything below it that is linked to it through logic will also update. So nothing started. We're gonna go ahead and drag that all the way down. What we haven't covered yet is cost. And you can also enter cost in here. There's no cost for a milestone project start, but to hire an architect, 
Our friend Mary, she's in human resources. Let's say that human resources charges us a thousand dollar fixed fee every time we go through them for hiring a resource. So we're gonna go ahead and enter a thousand dollars. That number will not change. Approved designs, simply a decision that Mark will have to make once he reviews them. Zero cost associated with there. Oh, okay, we're hiring another engineer. That's gonna be $1,000 because we're also going through Mary. You can see that you then enter all of your costs and it's a lot easier to track here. What we have talked about so far is making sure that we are setting the project schedule up from scratch within Smartsheet. Before we do so, we want to get familiar with the toolbar. We want to go ahead and add any columns in that we would like to track something on. We are going to go to our drop down here and make sure we edit project settings to ensure that the predecessors are turned on and that our work hours and days align with what we're actually doing within our organization. We have set up our automation so that anytime a row changes, whoever is assigned to that row is notified. And I wanna show you something else. We talked earlier about being able to add comments here. I wanna add a new one and I wanna highlight that you can send attachments through comments and you can actually tag someone here as well if they have a Smartsheet account. Now, the recipients of the comment will be notified based on their own notification settings. So however they have their individual account set up in Smartsheet, which you can do by clicking on your profile up here in the right-hand corner, However you have it set up is how you will receive notifications. So if you're a project manager, you may wanna have that discussion with your team. If you want them to be notified instantaneous upon tagging them in a comment, then make sure that their notifications align with that. There we go. So I just wanted you to know that you could also tag people in the comments if they have a Smartsheet account and make sure that they have their notifications turned on and that they align with your expectations. Once you get all of your resources assigned in this column, I mentioned earlier that in this indicator column, if anyone is over allocated, which means that they are assigned to more tasks in an eight hour day than they can actually accomplish, you're going to see a little indicator that pops up in this column. That's what that means when we're talking about over allocated resources. Let's go back to the views that we touched on earlier in the video. We are in grid view. This is what I recommend again when you're building out your project schedule in Smartsheet. Let's look at Gantt view, however. What Gantt view is going to show you is the duration of the task in alignment with a timeline above. These bars align to the lines where the work is actually represented. For example, hire architect. This is the beginning of when you will start hiring that architect and this is the end. And you can look above to see the number of days that's going to take. You can also see who's doing that. Mary is assigned to that and that it feeds into a milestone. Milestones are represented with diamonds when you're looking at a Gantt chart. Once Mark approves the designs, you'll see that it then moves into hiring the engineer. So again, the Gantt chart view shows you the work over a timeline. I talked about the critical path earlier, and I want to show you how to see what the critical path is in case you're trying to shorten the overall duration of your project. This is a great thing to know. If you look at this button in the upper right-hand corner, it shows a red bar, black bar, red bar. That is what you're going to click in order to see your critical path. When I click on that, you see which tasks make up the actual critical path. Hire architect, hire engineer, and if I scroll to the right, you will see the remaining critical task. If I wanted to shorten the duration of my overall project, 
these are the tasks that I would focus on right now. Another view is card view. This is a great way to visually see where all the work in your project is once you move into execution mode. If you click on card view, you will see that our project is not started yet. And so all of the work is going to fall in the not started column. However, once execution begins, you'll be able to see all of the tasks that are in progress and the tasks that are complete by this view. You can also drag these around to mark them as in progress or complete, and it makes the actual updates in the grid or Gantt chart. I mentioned earlier that you can share your smart sheet with other people so that they've got access to it. In order to do that, you go up here to the blue share button and you can invite others to collaborate. So if you click on that, this is where you will enter names or email addresses and that will invite them to begin collaborating on your Smartsheet. You can set their permissions using this dropdown. You can make someone an admin, which pretty much gives them full rights to update the project schedule. The editor that can share, so they would be able to, yes, edit the project schedule and share it with other people. You can also assign someone as an editor that cannot share or simply as a viewer. So you will enter people's email addresses in here. You can edit the subject line and you can send them a personal message. You can also CC yourself if you'd like so that you get a copy of the message and can confirm it went out. Now, if someone does not have a Smartsheet account, therefore you're unable to share this with them to make edits, it doesn't mean that they can't see what's going on within the project. If you look over here to the far right, there are some other options here. I'm going to hover over the globe here and it says publish. The publish option is great for people that do not have a Smartsheet account. So if you are working with clients outside of your organization, or even if the number of licenses to Smartsheet within your organization is limited, publishing is a good option for you. And it gives you a lot of different options here for what people will see when you share the published link with them. You can offer them a read only to where they can just look at the project schedule. This is a basic sheet version without attachments or comments. So they would not be able to look at anything that you have attached within the smart sheet. They would not be able to see any of the comments or anyone that is tagged in anything. You can also give read only full, which would be an advanced sheet version that allows you to download attachments and view comments. So if you do want them to be able to download attachments and view comments, this is the one for you. You can also share the option to edit by anyone. Now I would be very careful with this in that whoever has this link is going to be able to edit any of the cells. If you do not want that to be the case, do not share the edit by anyone. I know that as a project manager, I would be very hesitant to send this option out. There's also an option down here for calendar. It allows people to add key dates from this sheet to their non-smart sheet calendar. For example, if Mark does not have a smart sheet account, he's the project sponsor, However, he wanted to add dates that he is assigned to. So for approved designs, he can go ahead and go in, take a look at this and see what those dates are and link them to his Outlook calendar, for example. The good thing about the publishing option is that it's not a snapshot in time. If they have that link, they'll be able to constantly go in and see the current version of the Smartsheet. So publish option is a great one for anyone that does not have access to Smartsheet. You can share it with anyone that does have access to Smartsheet. And don't forget to save your changes. It will constantly remind you. You can change the notifications for that in your actual account 
which again is up here in the far right hand side. If you want more frequent or less frequent notifications to save, you can change that accordingly. That concludes building out our project schedule within Smartsheet from scratch. I hope that you learned something today. I do wanna show you that to get back to your workspace, the only thing that you have to do is go up and hover over these three lines in the upper left-hand corner. If I click on that, you will see that the left menu will pop up again. And I'm gonna click on Home. That's gonna show me my workspaces and any other sheets that I have access to. I want to make sure that I keep adding all documents relating to this project in the building a house workspace and they will all show up here when I click on it. Thank you again for joining me today. I would appreciate it if you subscribe to my YouTube channel. Again, I'm Candace Porter.